We are in our series for November, and our series is called Trees. And we visited last week the cedar tree and the week before the almond tree. And today in our message, I want to talk to you about the juniper tree, the juniper tree. And so I'll start out again with our verse from Isaiah 65 and verse 22, our verse and theme for this message series. As the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. The juniper tree in the Bible, or actually as the Bible calls it, is actually what is called today a broom tree. It's called a broom tree. Actually, more technically, a white broom tree. It's very common in the Middle East. It's common around Lebanon, Mount Carmel, Gilead, Jordan, and the Dead Sea. And the juniper tree or the broom tree, as I'm calling it, isn't actually much of a tree at all. It's only about 12 feet tall. And uh, the name white broom actually comes from the clusters. There are small clusters of flowers that bloom along its branches. And so it's called a white broom tree. It kind of fans out. And another thing about the white broom tree is that it dwells in desert places and in desert areas. And often, they offer excellent shade because they're one of the few plants that are able to survive in that type of an environment. It's also essential for making charcoal for fire. In the Middle East, they would use the white broom tree to actually make charcoal which I thought was very interesting. And sometimes we hear it mentioned even in the Bible with expressions like this, the coals of juniper. You can look it up and find it there. But as I mentioned in our very first message in this series, trees can be a place of refuge, a place of shelter. How many of us are in need of a place of shelter today? Anybody feeling that way? You need a sheltering place? How many are in need of refuge? There are so many hurts, so many pains, so many trials and circumstances. Life gets overwhelming at times. A lot of times, right? Not just at times. I've found that life is usually more overwhelming and there are a few times when it's not overwhelming than the other way around. Life can be overwhelming. And sometimes we need a place of refuge. We need a place of shelter. Sometimes we feel like just going somewhere and telling the world to just go away for a little while. You remember that old song, Make the World Go Away? Anybody remember that? I'm date- you, some of you, I'm dating you when you say, yeah, I remember that, Pastor. I remember it. So, But yeah, make the world go away. Sometimes we feel this way. We want to just go somewhere where we can take refuge, where we can find rest, where we can find the strength to carry on. Maybe some of you have thought that before. I wish I could just go to a place where no one knows who I am, no one misses me, and I could just be there by myself in this place and stay there and and not be needed, not anything, and just be able to just breathe for a second, to just rest for a second. Some of us with children, I think, probably feel that more often, right? I just need a place to go and rest and breathe. Or in our language, I need a break. (laughs) I need a break. Well, I want to talk to you about someone. His name was Elijah. And Elijah came to this place himself. He had done some pretty amazing feats with the power of God. He called fire down from heaven in the presence of a bunch of priests of Baal. He calls fire down from heaven and it consumes Elijah's altar and all the stones and everything that's there, the water, everything's completely lapped up and gone. He did some really amazing things. But Elijah came to a place in his life where he needed refuge. 
He needed shelter. And it was all because of a woman. I, I almost ducked there. But it really was. You see, he had an adversary. Just as we have adversaries. But this woman was not just a normal woman. She was evil. I mean, she was evil, everybody. And she was married to an evil king. And her name was Jezebel. And she was married to a king, and his name was Ahab. And together they made up an evil pair. However, Jezebel was more dominant. She ruled the roost, so to speak. And Ahab was kind of more passive. Didn't make him any less evil, but he was a little more passive. And so Jezebel, as we would say in today's society, right, she wore the pants in that family. All right? And she was awful, terrible. And you see, what happened is when Elijah went up against these priests and prophets of Baal, which belonged to Jezebel because she worshipped, we'll call him a god with a little g, he not only called fire down, not only consumed all the altar, he not only made them look completely foolish. How many of you know the story? The priests and the prophets are walking around, they're cutting themselves, they're praying to their God, and guess what? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. And Elijah prays and fire comes down and consumes the altar. But not only did he embarrass them, not only did he humiliate them and totally make it very apparent to everyone that their God was fake, but he also killed all of them. The Bible says that Elijah took his sword and killed them all. Now I want you to think about that. All right, now we're in the Old Testament here. Things were a little bit different in the Old Testament, okay, than they are today, all right? I'm not advocating for you to do something like this, but I'm telling you that Elijah not only embarrassed Jezebel by embarrassing all of her priests and prophets and made her look like a complete fool and made her God out to be nothing because that's what he is, nothing because he was not a God, he was a figment of their imagination, a created deity. Not only did he do all that, but he slaughtered all of her priests and prophets. And that made her a little bit angry. Just a little. It made her angry. You know what makes the enemy, our adversary, the devil, you know what makes him really mad? Start taking out his soldiers start taking them out. Now let's put this into perspective today, okay? Again, what makes him really mad is when someone that he has full control and he has in bondage and he has in an addiction and he has in his grasp, when they come into a church and they hear the gospel and they get saved and those chains are broken and they become saved, and they become a saint, and they move from his side to God's side. Do you understand what I'm saying? That makes him really mad when that happens. You know why? Because it shows everyone that his power isn't what it seems to be. Just like what Elijah did to those priests and prophets, he exposed the fact that, hey, listen, their power is limited. Their power isn't even what it appears to be. It's deceptive. And it makes the enemy mad. It makes the devil mad. It really makes him mad when we preach the gospel to people who are in bondage and we see them delivered. When we start showing Jesus Christ to people who have an addiction, who are in torment, and we see them delivered. You start foiling the plans of the enemy in their life and you're bound to make him mad. You're bound to make him mad. And so, Elijah... In his actions, he made Jezebel really mad. She was very infuriated with him. And so here's what happened. Ahab, which was Jezebel's husband, the king, we'll call him her husband, she was wicked. 
He went and told his wife. What a weak man, by the way. What a weak man. Gosh, this was the person that was the king. What a weak man. Can you imagine? Hey, honey, guess what happened? Guess what happened? You're not going to believe this. Like, well, come on, man. Anyways, he says, he, he basically tells on Elijah to his wife, guess what Elijah did? Look what Elijah did. Anyway, he tells Jezebel what Elijah, Elijah had done. And so Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah. And this is what she said. Look at what she said in 1 Kings 19, 1 to 2. She said, so may the gods do to me more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. She was saying this, you're a dead man this time tomorrow. That's what she was telling him. You're dead. You're a dead man, Elijah, for what you did. Isn't this the way that the devil works? He sends his messengers to deliver his message to you and try to put fear into your heart, try to strike fear into you, try to intimidate you, try to do all these things. This is what she did. She sent her messenger. You're a dead man, Elijah. You know, what she was saying is, if you something doesn't happen to you, if I don't punish you somehow, then what happened what happened to my priest is going to happen to me. She was, in my opinion, she was scared because she knew if she didn't do something to somewhat rectify the situation that had happened, then it was coming for her. And this is what happens when people are really in darkness, are really in bondage. They will do whatever it takes to avoid punishment. And the punishment will be great. These people that walk around, they parade around, and they, they, they do things, and they, they, you know, try to promote all of these things that are darkness, and they go out there and do this. Do you know why they come after the people, come after the church so hard? Why these different communities, we'll call them, come after the church so hard? Because if they fail, it's going to be really bad for them. Let me say this again. When they fail, it's going to be really bad for them. Okay? And this is what Jezebel was sensing. This is what she was sensing. Because she was being orchestrated. She was being completely puppeted by Satan. That's what was happening. She was just a puppet. She was one of his minions. And you know what? He doesn't deal well with his minions when they mess up and when they lose someone. Let me explain that to you. Let me show you what I mean. Do you remember Jesus crossing the sea and he found the man from, uh, uh, the, from Gad, the Gadarene demoniac. Remember him? Filled with a legion of demons. And do you remember what the demons said, what they said to Jesus when he was going to cast them out? Let me just tell you. The, they, the demons are even afraid of what could happen if they fail, when they fail. Look what it says in Matthew 8.31. It says, the devils besought him, talking to Christ, saying this, if you cast us out, he was going to cast them out. There was no ifs about it. It was going to happen. If you do this, suffer us to go away into that herd of swine. So they were almost asking God, asking Jesus Christ for a favor. We've been tormenting this man. He was cutting himself. He was spending time amongst the tombs. He was completely isolated from the world. And they said, we've been tormenting this man, but would you please suffer us? Would you give us amnesty? Would you suffer us for what we've been doing? In essence, they're saying this, don't send us into torment. Send us in. We'd rather you send us into that herd of swine right there than to send us into torment. Send us into the pigs. Okay, so Christ said, all right, fine. So he sent them into the pigs. And you know what happened? The pigs were smart enough to know. Now, pigs are not smart animals. 
I've never raised hogs before. Some of you may have, but they're not the brightest animals. I've seen people lead them around the fair before or try to lead them around the fair, all right? But even the pigs were smart enough to know this is not good. We don't want this inside of us. So what did they do? They jumped into the water and committed suicide. Guess where the demons ended up having to go? Right back into torment where they didn't want to be. Why? Because they had failed. And they knew what was coming. They knew what was going to happen when they got back from where they were sent and had failed. There's great punishment for losing. This is why demonic forces try so hard not to lose what they have a hold on. This is why it's so hard to break addiction in someone's life. This is why it's so hard to break bondages for people to come out of that. Because, listen, there is an adversary. Oh, pastor, this is weird. You're talking about all this spiritual stuff. Listen, this is a church, and this is scriptural, everybody. These things happen. You start to see through spiritual eyes, you will see these things happen. And they, demonic forces, have a grasp. They don't want to let go, but they have to. They have to. You know what Jesus said? Go. That's what he told them. Go. Be gone. You know what we say? Be gone in the name of Jesus, right? Because it's at his word. They have a hold. They have a grasp. They do not want to let go. But praise God, the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus drives them out. It breaks all the chains. And a hold on that, that person is loosed. It's loosed. The gathering demoniac following that time, he had a legion, legion of demons inside of him. Following that time, what does he do? He goes and he's a witness to 10 cities of what God had done for him. Man, that really probably ticked off the devil. Not only is he delivered, not only is his grasp gone, but now he's witnessing and evangelizing for the kingdom. So Elijah's threatened. Jezebel tells him, you are a dead man. You're dead this time tomorrow. Because of what you've done, you're dead. And he was scared. He actually took a day's journey into the wilderness, into the desert. And guess where he found himself? Under a juniper tree. Let's look here in 1 Kings 19, 4 through 7. We find he's discouraged, he's scared, he's downtrodden, and he's laying under a juniper tree. And he was so depressed. He had come to such a low point in his life that he actually asked God, he said, God, just let me die. Look what it says. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it's enough now, Lord. O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. How many of you have ever been in this place? Don't raise your hand. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. But how many of you have ever been in this place? Lord, this is enough. Just let me die. It's too much. I'm tired of it. Now, we can be honest today. I can't take it anymore. Just let me die. I can't take any more of this. What a place to be in. What a place. But we find so many people in this place. So many people. I just want to die. I don't want to live anymore. I don't have a reason to live anymore. And look at what had caused Elijah to get here. This man he, he, who had called fire down from heaven, who was a prophet, he spoke for God to the people. And now because of a woman and the words of a woman, through a messenger to him that brought fear into his heart, he just wants to die and he feels like he's a total failure. All because he was afraid of a threat. Of a threat from a person whose God had just been defeated. 
I want you to hear that. He was scared of someone who he had just, who God had just shown him, there is no power over you with this God. This God is fake. This God does not exist. This God is non-existent. They can cut themselves. They can parade themselves around. He has no power over you. And yet Elijah allowed one of the, the, the minions of that God to strike fear in his heart. And so he finds himself under a juniper tree. How many of us find ourselves allowing the devil to bring fear into our lives? He's a defeated foe. He's defeated. This is the parallel here, people. He's defeated, just like Jezebel. Her God was defeated on the mountain. And yet, Elijah allowed himself to be fearful of her all because of what? She made a threat to him. I'm going to kill you. You'll be dead this time tomorrow. Now, I've never had someone tell me they were going to kill me and mean it. I don't know if you have, but I've never had that happen. I mean, I've had some people say it, you know, hopefully jokingly, but I've never had someone really threaten that they were going to take my life. But I'm not sure if they did that I would respond much differently than Elijah. To be honest, if someone said sincerely that they were going to take my life, I can't tell you that I would just respond in boldness and faith. I would probably be looking just like Elijah for a place of refuge. I would be looking for a place where I could have shelter. I'm not sure I would, would respond differently. And this is what's happening here. But you know, we should. We should. How should Elijah have responded? Hey, my God just brought fire down from heaven. Bring it on, woman. Right? Bring it on. Try it. Try it. See what happens. But that's not what happened. Instead, he flees into the desert. He finds refuge under the juniper tree. He's discouraged and he's fearful. But I want you to see what happens in 1 Kings chapter 9, continuing in 5 through 7. It says, As he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals. Remember, I told you that the juniper tree was used for charcoal. And a, cr a crust of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. So an angel of the Lord came, and he fed Elijah. He woke him up from his sleep. He woke him up, and he fed him. But he let him rest again. I want you to notice that. He let him rest. But then the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. So Elijah's sleeping under this juniper tree, the broom tree. And the angel of the Lord, which many believe to be a pre-incarnate form of Christ, comes to him. And he touches him. And he feeds him. Hey, in your time of discouragement, in your time of desperation, in your time of need and despair and depression and fear, Jesus Christ will come to you and he will comfort you. Look what he did. He prepared food. The Bible says, the psalmist David wrote, he prepares a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. And he let Elijah rest. He'll give you rest. He'll give you rest. But guess what? He's not going to let you just lay under the juniper tree like Elijah. He's not just going to let you lay there. Yes, he's going to let you take refuge. He's going to let you take shelter. He's going to feed you. He's going to encourage you. But he does not want you to stay discouraged and depressed and living and laying on the ground under a tree. That's not what he wants for you. And so the second time, he says, hey, arise and eat. Guess what? I have something for you to do. There's more for you to do. There's more for you to do. Sometimes we take these attacks from the devil, and it's like, God, just let me die, right? God, I'm done with this. 
I'm done with it. I'm done. Just let me be. Just let me die. Just let me cease. But God's not done with us. He's not done. And he says, you know what? You need to get up. You need to eat because there's more for you to do. There's more for you to do, Elijah. Isn't it like the Lord? Isn't it like the Lord, the way that he responded? He, I, I really think it's neat that he let Elijah go back to sleep. Like, wasn't it enough that he woke him up? Wasn't it enough that he fed him and encouraged him? Like, wouldn't you think he would just be like, okay, I fed you. I encouraged you. Why are you going back to sleep? Think of your own children if you have them, right? You switch on the light in the morning. Time to get up. Usually we're very gentle, at least in my house. Hey, time to get up. My wife will even go in with the lights off. You know, and just open the door. Time to get up, everybody. It's time to get up. Then nothing happens, right? About 10 minutes later, you walk by the room. Lights are still off. Blankets are still over the heads. And then things change at that point, right? You start to unload some of that on the children. If you don't get out of that bed right now... I told you this long ago to do this, right? That's humanity. That's what we do, all right? But look what the Lord does. He lets Elijah rest. He understands. Man, being dis discouraged and in despair, being depressed, it takes a lot out of you. It, it takes a lot out of you. If you've ever been there, you'll know that. And if, you're, if you know someone who's in that position, you need to understand that. It takes a lot out of you. It wears you down. It wears you out. And the Lord said, okay, just rest. Just rest. But then the second time, it's not like he comes back with a hurricane and just lets Elijah have it. Again, he just says, Elijah, wake up, arise, eat, for it's time. You have a long journey. He's gentle. He leads us. He guides us. He comforts us. He gives us a second touch. Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need a second touch. The Lord will come and you'll be dealing with a situation and, and you know that he's given you a touch. You know that he's given you some healing. You know he's given you some encouragement. You know he's given you, he's boistered your faith. He's he started to help you and you know that. But you need another touch from him and he'll do that for you. And he says, arise. And it says, Elijah got up and he made a journey 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain. 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long journey, everybody. How far did we walk at the parade the other night? Maybe a mile and a half. Can you imagine a 40 day and 40 night journey through the desert? And you know what is a little bit funny to me? So we find Elijah laying under this broom tree, begging God, asking God, requesting God, just let me die. And do you know something? Elijah still has not died. He was taken up, the Bible says, in a chariot of fire. He never died. Isn't that the humor of God? This man that says, God, just let me die. And God says, actually, I'm going to do the very opposite. You're going to just continue living. You're just going to continue living. Nah, Elijah, how about you just continue to live and live and live? This is what God wants for you. You may be in a place where you are saying, God, just let me die. Now, maybe that's metaphorically, right? God, I'm done with this. I'm done with this. I'm just done. Make the world go away, remember? But God has a life for you to live. He has a life for you to live. He has a life that's more abundant in John 10.10. 10. And you know how great our Savior is? You know how great our God is? He feeds us first. He lets us rest. He makes us lie down, as the psalmist says. Sometimes we need to be made to lie down. He makes us lie down. And then he says, child, 
Arise, eat something. The journey is too great for you, but not for me. Take rest in my strength. Don't be afraid. Take refuge in me. By the way, remember what I said about what failing in the kingdom of darkness meant for Jezebel because she failed. Elijah never died. She said he was going to die the next day, and that didn't come true. You see, the devil likes to make threats. He likes to make threats, but Jesus Christ has the last word. Amen? It didn't come through. It didn't come true. But to her, to Jezebel, the one who threatened Elijah, man, I'll tell you what, she died in a horrible way. She was thrown from a wall. She was trampled by horses. And when they went to bury her, they, all they found was her skull and her hands and her feet because she was consumed by dogs. She was unrecognizable. They couldn't even tell who she was. Come on, this is what God is going to do to the enemy that's coming after you. This is what he's going to do to them. Hey, you want to make a threat to one of God's children? Be my guest, like I just should have said. My God just called fire. He brought fire from heaven and consumed the altar. Bring it on. Because look what happened. Look what happened to that enemy that made that threat against him, that caused all those problems. And this is what God is saying today. If I did that for Elijah, I can do the same thing for you. But he doesn't kick us and say, get up. He says, arise, eat something. If you need to rest, I'll let you rest a little longer. But not forever, everybody. I'm not going to just let you lay there in the dust. It's time to get up and do what I've called you to do. Don't let fear and discouragement drive you into the wilderness. That's the first thing. If you're going to be driven anywhere, if you're going to let it, dri dri let it drive you into Jesus Christ and into his arms, that's the best place to go. That's the best place to run. That's the best place to find refuge. Not under a tree, not under something the world can provide for you, right? Nature, that's what Elijah did. He ran out into the desert and hid under a tree. I remember other people in the Bible in the book of Genesis hiding in the trees right not a good idea when they should have just ran to the father but if it has if fear and depression and discouragement has driven you to that place know that you're not alone Jesus Christ will find you even if you're curled up in the middle of a desert underneath a tiny broom tree barely even a tree actually a lot of people consider it a bush even if you're there He'll find you. He'll feed you. He'll set you back on your feet again. And he'll set you on your way. He has a life for you to live. A life more abundantly. And like Elijah who said, let me die, let me die, let me die. Guess what? God said, no, I'm going to let you live. Let you live. Let you live. And keep on living. And keep on living. And keep on living. And that's what Lord has for each and every one of you today. Life. Life. Take refuge in Him. Find your refuge in Him. If you're discouraged, if you're depressed today, know, know that there's one who cares. He knows what you've been through. He knows what you're going through. Maybe you've been left under the tree. Maybe you've been deserted. Maybe you're feeling that way. God, I've been deserted too many times. I've put my heart out there and gotten left in the desert. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never desert you. He'll find you. He'll say, son, daughter, arise. And he'll feed you and he'll set you on your way.